Hi. Can't hear you. There we go. Can you hear me? Yes. Hi. Are you uh, Terry? I'm Terry, um, and my uh, boss will be coming in in just a minute, and she's the owner of the dog. Sure. So, and we've got a few people here who are going to be joining in as well. Oh, sure. uh, of course. We are all the staff um, here. Hi. Hi. And we all kind of take to, and okay. here's our dog. <laughs> <laughs> there he is. Okay. Hello. The troublemaker, huh? Yeah, the troublemaker. <laughs> okay. Okay, just, here we go. Um, um, before we get started, and I put it on the form, it's on the website, but we've begun recording our Zoom sessions and consultations. Okay? Okay. Um, okay. Just a heads up. Um, so I was reading real quick over your consultation. Uh, it just seems like uh, you had one trainer before, but you're, you're struggling with uh, dog reactivity. Right, on a leash, just with other dogs. He, he loves people, great with people. It's just okay. on with when he sees another dog. And you know, it's like trying to hold back a horse because he's 70 pounds and um, yeah, we had the other trainer for a while, but it was not consistent, admittedly, um, just because of like scheduling issues. So I think now is we want to just kind of get down to business with it. And I can add something. Sometimes when, uh, uh, for example, I walk the dog and he can see one of us. So friends, for, uh, for example, another uh, side of the street, he pulls like a crazy, he's so emotionally, so excited, so happy. And it's hard to control him because he pulls so hardly. He just want to go and... Uh... Obviously, you're, you're <laughs> so, uh... Okay. Um, when, you, you, when you worked with the other trainer, was it with food? Yes. Yeah, yes. she has uh, the food uh, treats. Okay, only food? I believe so, yes. I believe okay. so, yeah. It was, uh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Here we go. Jesse, this is Karen. She Hi, is the owner of Remington. <laughs> Remington has many, many owners. <laughs> I can see that. A lot of people involved. So, um, but everybody who sort of deals with him, we thought should be on this call to... For sure. Hear what you have to say. So um, okay. I, I, was talking, I interrupted. Where where did we end up? We were just basically, he was just asking some questions yeah. about what previous training uh, Remington has had. Correct. And if trained using food, which they did. But I Correct. said he wasn't consistent training due to some like scheduling issues mostly. So that's, that's kind of where we were at. Yeah. What, what kind of, um, is he on a, on a harness or a flat collar? What kind of collar? What do you walk him on? A prong collar. He's on a prong collar. Okay. Um, did you get that yourselves or was that from the trainer? It was recommended by the trainer. Yeah. I don't know if we bought it or we if he bought it, it. But it was recommended by the trainer. Okay. Did they show you how to use it at all? Yep. Uh, did they talk to you about corrections? Uh, corrections. Yeah, like if he barks at a dog, how to correct that or how to correct pulling or no. Well, it, 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 the only solution uh, when I was involved, and I'm sure we talked about something called leash aggression. We've termed it that. We don't know if that's it, but he does go after other dogs. I mean, but um, I mean, part of the solution was to put him on the other side of you when you're approaching a dog, but you know, there are so many dogs and you know, you have to have your head on a swivel all the time to, yeah, you were talking about it, yes. <laughs> right, right, right. Um, so so does, does Remington have any dog friends? He used to go to a play group at Best Friends and his report cards were as played well with other dogs. Uh, he doesn't do that as much anymore, um, just because, I don't know why. I think there was a, he got some, um, what did he get? A uh, cough. Kennel cough? 
uh, yeah, a kennel cough that was, you know, so we just yeah. sort of, and with, you know, uh, the people here that love him, he doesn't, he's not boarded. Um, so he either goes home with Terry or Anna and Arthur. Um, so he rarely interacts with other dogs now. He does have two dog friends in Aspen that um, his dog walker has two, two dogs that he plays well with, I guess. Sure. Okay. Um, anything else about Remington I should know? What, go ahead. Uh, uh, something. Uh, I want to say that the Remington is not aggressive. This is a feedback from the uh, uh, groomer. Uh, he goes to and he says he's uh, uh, neutral. He's, uh, he does never presented, you know, uh, uh, any uh, aggressiveness or anything like this. So at the groomer. A, at the groomer's right. I mean, this is uh, so. Basically, the problem is when he is under leash. Uh, well, under what? And it's other dogs, not. I, oh no, no, of course, with the other dogs. Yeah, it's not people. You've never, I've never seen. Well, I take that back. Uh, yeah, a few instances, but uh, if you're taking a bone from underneath him or something, have you have you noticed any other incidences with people? I don't know. Uh, I've heard, I didn't see it, uh, Mr. Craviel. So Mrs. Craviel tried to take his bone yeah. away yeah. from yeah. him. Yeah. You, had, you had once, Larissa, had yeah. once incident. Mine was Never a paper had, towel. Uh, had to, uh, to be, yeah. But, you know, we've had a few uh, incidents. Yeah, it's usually when he's got something like a bone and you reach in fast to take it. Yeah. He'll, but this was he'll a snap. Uh, this was a while ago. It's yeah. been a while. I haven't it's seen anything while. in a long yeah. while. Right, right, right. So. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, uh, so that's resource guarding. That's, that's not that uncommon. The, you know, if he has a, an object and he doesn't want you to take it, you know, a lot of dogs do that. It doesn't mean it can't be addressed if it needs to be, um, but it's not out the ordinary, okay? Um, anything else with Remington? He's actually training as well. Um, <laughs> he, he's very strong, his nose and poking you and, uh, Okay. leaning in against you. Uh, I mean, he's training us very well when he wants food, when he wants to be petted. He's very smart. He can hear my exercise drawer in the bedroom open from three, three rooms away, and he thinks he might be able to go on a walk. So he, he has a, quite a vocabulary. Yeah. He's really... <laughs> okay. Um... All right, so this is pretty standard stuff. Nothing out the ordinary here. I work with this stuff all the time. Uh, part of the problem is uh, the prong collar is, is better. It's a better tool for handling Remington. However, your previous trainer didn't uh, go over with you uh, either correctly or at all uh, how to apply it. Okay, so that's a big problem. It's not it's not put a prong collar on a dog and then they're magically good. You have to be able, you have to use it. It's a tool. So if you're not using that tool, you're not going to get the results. Okay. When it comes to behavior work, like the dog reactivity, uh, food really doesn't matter. Okay. So Remington is most likely being reactive, um, uh, as in like, like throwing a temper tantrum. Okay. So if he's great or he's been great with playing with dogs, you know, at, at the daycare and not at the, and at the groomer, he's fine and all that stuff. A leash reactivity or, or, or a dog reactivity doesn't always mean aggressive. Okay. It means frustrated. Uh, it can mean I want to go play with that dog, kind of like a kid screaming, give me that toy, but instead he's barking. Uh, in other cases, it can be aggression, right? But, it, but if it's aggression, like the dog wouldn't be able to socialize anywhere, okay? Yeah. It'd be a problem. He wouldn't have been able to go to daycare. They'd be having an issue with him at the, the groomer and all that stuff. It's only when he's on a leash, right? So it's most likely frustration because he wants to play with the dog, but he can't, okay? Uh, also, when you walk Remington, is there like tension on the leash? Do you have to hold them back or anything? Yeah. Well, I, when we see a dog, because he will jerk hard. Uh, when we see a dog approaching, and particularly when we're hiking in Aspen, I just had a very bad situation. I stepped off the trail, I tightened the leash to try to let this dog go by. And I, you know, said to the lady, you know, he, you know, acts out on leash sometimes. So 
but she's like, and so the dog, we yes. asked her to put the dog on the leash, came over and sniffed um, Remington's bottom and Remington, I thought he was gonna eat the dog. I mean, he jerked out of my hand so fast and just sure. uh, really aggressively went after this dog. Well, sure, so in that sense, yeah. uh, if he's been approached with, with you when he was on a leash, two things, one, he's trying to protect you because you're, you're like a territory, if you will, right? You have your personal space. So if you're outside walking by yourself and then and someone you don't know comes into your personal space, it makes you feel uncomfortable, right? Right. So for Remington, if that's the case where on the leash, a dog actually approached you and you saw an aggressive response, that may have been to protect you or him, right? Because he's like, I don't know who you are. But in a social setting, he's capable of being social, right? Yeah. So the, the common kind of ideology or thought process about dogs is dogs should love everyone and everything no matter what. And that's not reality. That's not how it works. Okay. So we have a dog right now that we're training with a client and the dog is, was very uh, severely dog reactive on a leash, like really bad. Okay. But completely social off the leash. Hmm. Okay. So uh, you know, we saw her one class, we saw her yesterday, and she's doing great. The dog is doing so much better, right? But she was like, why is that? I'm like, you know, the leash one removes uh, flight response. So the dog, if it's under stress, cannot run away. So that's not an option. So instead, he's using flight response, which is reactivity. Um, but when you remove that leash, he now, if needed, if he felt uncomfortable, can run away. So that's why there's no stress there, Okay. That or the fact of if he's with his owner and the dog approaches, he feels the need to protect his owner because he thinks he's the one that's in charge within that moment. Okay. So there's a lot of variables when it comes to it. I believe you do have a social dog, but he's just not trained or he's not, uh, how would you say, he's not been disciplined well. So he thinks he's the one that's calling the shots. And ultimately, you know, he's not doing anything wrong, so to say, if he's protecting you because that's where he's coming from, right? But in the yeah. human world, when it's somebody, somebody with a social dog trying to greet, like we know that part, right? Because the owner just said dog's friendly, but Remington doesn't know that. Because he doesn't understand, hey, my dog's friendly. He doesn't understand what that means. So he just thinks I'm with my mom, you know, I'm with my uncle, my aunt. I need to protect them. So I'm going to assert myself. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah, and we don't know how to reprimand him when he does it. I mean, I, yeah, we don't know how to untrain him. But I'm also afraid to let him off the leash because he acts so aggressive. I honestly don't know what would happen. Sure. Would he still be as aggressive if he's off the leash and he's walking with me and another dog comes up? I don't know. That's a, that's a, that's what we don't know, right? Yeah. So there's, so um, another common uh, kind of misconception is let's say you know we train Remington we fix the reactivity it's not a problem all that stuff right and maybe when my staff and I have Remington we can socialize them no problem right but then when you try to socialize them it's a problem and the reason is when Remington's with us he's gonna see us as an authority Okay, we're not here to be Remington's buddies. We're not here to be his friends, right? We're here to fix the issue and to, 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 to teach him that this is not acceptable, right? But with you, with the family and the staff, he sees you as buddies, right? Well, we're we're shmooly pies. Remington's in charge, clearly. Right. <laughs> and that's why you would have problems because you can't be the authority and be his buddy at the same time. So you like make, so you'll make steps forward in a lot of areas, but then you might find in certain areas you struggle and it's because of that concept. Okay. okay. So all it means is uh, like the reactivity I'm not worried about, but like, let's say you wanted to see if you could socialize Remington, right? I have ways I can teach, but I would have to teach you and your staff. Okay. It's not fix the dog and then give them back and then he's perfect. Because if you're not doing the same stuff that we're doing, you're still going to struggle. Right. Okay. 
He's not like a vehicle where, you know, if you, if you need a new engine, you send it to the mechanic, they replace the engine, you get the car back, good as new, right? He, right. He's going by relationship. So if he thinks I've been with you for X amount of years and we've always been buddies, how is it today that you're going to tell me that I can't be aggressive? Right. You have to, you have to teach them to unlearn that pattern and to now learn, Hey, we are asserting ourselves now and you need to respect us just like you respect Jesse and his staff um, and behave yourself. And if you don't behave yourself, we're going to reprimand you. Okay? okay. And then once he starts to associate that and go, Oh, okay. You're not my buddy. You're, you're an authority. They'll start to let things go. But it has to be consistent. It can't be your buddy one day and then authority another day, you know, and I'm not saying you have to be always firm and strict with him. But I want to, when, when I reward a dog with affection, I don't do it because he pooped me with his nose or because he sat on my lap. That's actually what empowers him. Because he thinks, okay. I bumped you with my nose and I told you to pet me and you did it. Yeah, we do. I mean, yeah. I do. Yeah. Right? <laughs> we all do yeah yeah so i would not reward him then or pet him because he told me to i would actually correct him you don't tell me what to do you know so like growing up if i if i if i needed something for my mom i wouldn't say mom i'm hungry make me a sandwich it was hey mom i'm hungry can you please make me something to eat right it's a very different conversation yeah. so when he's when he when he Books you and he sits on you and he rubs against you and he's, he's telling you do this and every time you do so he's learning he's the one in charge right so i wouldn't pet him then i would correct him i'm like you don't tell me when to pet you i'll pet you when i decide i'm ready okay just shifting little things like that plus holding him accountable accountable for behaviors that we don't want him to do um and then we see where it, where it gets us um okay. dogs aren't Go but ahead, you, you, you other, go ahead. Uh, dogs aren't concrete, like uh, the reactivity I'm not worried about, but like let's say trusting them off leash to greet another dog or so, um, that's, that's a big variable because that comes down to the owner and then the handlers and the staff, okay? Uh, I definitely can help you get to that point, but ultimately at the end of the day, you have to be able to do it in order to get there. Okay. Do you, you, do you, your uh, training techniques, do you use shock collars or any kind of- E-collar and prong collar, correct. Pardon me? E-collar or you, what you call a shock collar, we call it an e-collar. An e-collar right. and you use those. Correct. Okay. So the word shock came from old school e-collars. Um, they had, for instance, five levels, okay? The collars that we use have 127 levels. And what that means is five and 127 are the same, but we have 122 more breaks now. Okay. So it's much more refined. The technology, they actually use it on humans. Uh, if you've ever been to a chiropractor or a physical therapist, it's what's called a TENS unit, T-E-N-S. Okay. And it's what they use to move the muscles to uh, ease back pain or break up uh, scar tissue or build strength. Like if you haven't used your arm for a long time, you just can't start using it. They do little spasms to get it, uh, to build up your strength again. It's the same technology. It's a muscle contraction, okay? It's not electrocution. It's not like a taser, okay? The dog wears the collar here and it moves this muscle. There's nothing anywhere else, okay? Uh, in my opinion, the e-collar is more refined than the human version because in the human version, um, it's more electrical. So if you have a pacemaker, they have to be careful. Uh, there's risk of electrocution if there's water and there's risk of electrical burn if they don't uh, uh, keep an eye on it. With the e-collar, none, none of that happens. It's fully waterproof. It doesn't burn the dog and it's not going to electrocute the dog. Okay. It's a centralized current that moves the muscle that it makes contact with. So the reason why this, excuse me? I'm sorry, it's not a pain per se. It's, it's There's a level of discomfort. Discomfort? Okay. Correct. So the reason why these tools are effective, so your prong collar, right, the spiking one, yeah, um, is uh, meant to mimic a dog bite. 
That's why it looks like teeth. Okay, it's, mimic, it's meant to mimic a dog bite. And that's why I asked you, did your trainer teach you how to use it? And they did it. So with your current collar, if Remington becomes reactive, you would have to correct him with the prong collar to bite him to teach him to not do that. Okay. The issue with prong collar is one, if the dog is too far gone, you could yank him as hard as you can. He's not going to stop. Yeah. Yep, that's, okay. that's what it's gotten to. Yeah. Yes. Um, or it takes a lot of technical skill. Okay. And I have several dogs right now that we're training that were on prong collars that are doing e-collar now because prong collar didn't work. Okay. And I love prong collars, but it has its limitations. With the e-collar, it doesn't, we don't worry about physical strength anymore. Okay. I actually have a couple, they're about in their 60s to 70s, and we're training their golden doodle puppy six months with the prong collar. And they went three classes and they're yanking the puppy. Okay. And he wouldn't listen. And I told him, like, I, I was like, I would just put him on the e collar. Trust me, it's going to be so much easier. So they finally, they went, they got the e collar, came back 180, way better. Huh. They don't have to yank the dog anymore. They don't have to worry about how strong they are. Uh, they don't have to worry about the dog because he's going to be 60, 70 pounds too. He's going to be big and they're, in their, they're 60, 70 years old. So I told them, you know, with the e collar, it doesn't matter how strong you are because the e collar will compensate. I can make it very strong or I can make it very soft. The dog tells me what's right. So with this um, procedure, he would have it on when he's at home with us also. No, no just Only with you. Only if we need it. Only when you need it, right. So expect when you walk him, like you walk him with the prong, mm -hmm. but you would walk him with the e-collar, okay? Now a very common, again, another misconception is Jesse, well, if you're such a good trainer, why would my dog need this tool after training, right? So uh, does everybody drive? Yep. Yep, you guys know how to drive? You guys go on the expressway? Yeah. yeah. Does everybody go to the speed limit? <laughs> no. <laughs> why? What do you mean why? So you're in a hurry. <laughs> okay, but, but the law says to go 55 miles an hour. Right. Because there's no cop. Mm. That's why you go faster. Right? If there was a cop present, I would assume you'd go to speed limit. Yeah. Right? Because yeah. now there's an authority figure. So think of the e-collar as a cop on a collar. When Remington has it on, he knows he can't get away with stuff. And if he tries, well, now you have the ability to stop him very, or, or much easier than you would with the prong collar, okay? So it's not about how well the dog's trained, it's about opportunistic behavior. If he knows that collar is not on, just like you know when there's no cop around on the expressway, he's going to press the boundaries. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. The other thing you also want to remember, go back to is he still sees you as, he's still going to see you as buddies. You know, people, when we get dogs, we get dogs for companionship, right? Um, so the way I behave around dogs and the way people behave around dogs is very different. There's a lot of stuff that I don't do that people do, you know, just because that's what they're, that's how they were brought up with their dogs. So even though I will give you, advice and stuff on what not to do and, and what to do, you're naturally going to fall back on old habits to a degree. You know, you're not going to be like me. So that's another factor in why dogs push more with the owners than they do with us. Right. Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. So it's nothing bad. It just means when you walk Remington, he's got an e-collar and if he's a perfect dog in the house, then you don't need it in the house. You know, well, it's just like he has a bark collar on also uh, that we put. On. Is it the shock bark collar? Uh, it's yeah, a yeah, it, well, we've got a set a, for my brace. My brace doesn't make a sound. Okay, it's so it be, makes a sound, but yeah, not a shock per se, a vibration and a noise. Okay, so with those collars, they tend to not work. Um, How would you say? Um, 
because there's no uh, aversive. It's just a sound or, or, or a sensation. It's just a vibrate. It's neutral, yeah. right? The correctional bar collar, which does the same contraction that my e-collars e do, those over time will correct the issue because it's an aversive. So the dog goes, I don't, I don't want to bark because I don't want to get this stimulation. Whereas if it's just a tone, like who cares, you know? Yeah, he, le he learns it's not going to hurt him, I think. So yeah. Yeah, when he has very thick fur, it's probably, yeah. And I can show you ways of correcting Remington that, so you're not reliant on that bark collar. Um, and it depends on what he's barking at. You know, if he's barking at every little thing, that's usually nervousness or, or just like kind of like a neurosis with the dog, which can be stopped. Uh, in most cases, he's barking because he may hear something, maybe, a, you know, someone in the hallway or a neighbor, a dog, right, something outside. And you can teach him to not bark at that stuff when you're present. And when you're gone, he'll still bark, which provides you with security. So you don't kill security either. Right. Um, but you know, when we talk about discipline, you know, I was raised old school, I was spanked and it hurt, but the intention was not to hurt me, right? So for dogs, it's the same thing. When they discipline each other, they bite each other. That's their form of consequence. They don't put each other in time out. You know, they don't make them like write uh, the same sentence over and over again on a piece of paper, <laughs> you know? Like they don't care about that stuff. They bite each other, which is why prong collars and e-collars exist because that's how we can in a human way bite remington whenever we disagree with something okay, okay. questions or concerns no i think uh you know i guess the concern would be it's going to take time and effort from everybody who takes care of remington to sort of be on the same page so we would have to figure that out. Um, right. So you have a couple of options. Um, the great thing about e-collar is that it transfers very easily and you don't need a lot of technical skill. Okay. Um, as long, like, for instance, let's say with the barking on the leash, it's really just, we find the number that's going to get Remington to stop. As long as you're at that number, it doesn't matter who has the leash, they press the button. And if it's 50, 50 for you and 50 for you and 50 for you is going to be the same sensation. Right? So it makes that very easy in terms of, uh, how do you say, transferring discipline to the individual. Okay. Okay. So look, um, can I give you an example and tell me how the collar would work? You know, when you're hiking a trail in Aspen and it's relatively narrow and you step to the side to let yep. another dog and person go by, yep. at what point do you zap him? Or, you know, at what point do you... So there's two points to this, okay? One is obedience. And I know he's probably learned some stuff with the previous trainer, right? But it's not a... Uh, if you're trying to use obedience right now, it's not effective because of the method. Okay. If I step aside and so for us, we teach the, the heel command, which is walk with me, stay with me, sit when I stop. Okay. Heel is if I take one step, the dog takes one step. I take five steps. The dog takes five steps. When I stop, the dog automatically sits. Okay. This like is with that. no tension, no <laughs> tension. No leash if the owner wants to be off, the dog to be off these train. Okay, you can get that level of control with an e-collar. So if we've got good control over Remington, we really shouldn't even see the reactivity in the first place. Okay, however, it can happen, right? So let's say you're in Aspen, you're hiking, you see a dog with their owner, you would step aside, but Remington would immediately follow and just automatically sit. And then the idea here is that he's so well trained that they just pass by, you don't have to do anything, and then you just continue walking. Okay. That would be ideal. If Remington, if Remington were to look like he were gonna become reactive, right? Maybe his ears go up, maybe he starts to move his tail, maybe he starts to pick up his shoulders. You wouldn't wait for the explosion. 
you would correct them right there. Oh. The call. People wait for the explosion. That's the hardest part. The dog is already adrenalized. He's already at a 10. So then you have to be super high on the collar to get him to stop. But if I can get it early, we don't even see the explosion. Okay. okay. So there's two parts to this. You, Remington needs um, reliable obedience. Okay. The discipline behind that may resolve the reactivity issues because he's just so well trained. In some cases, if the reactivity issue is severe or the dog's practiced it for a long time, the owner will have like, let's say 80% of the reactivity done, but every now and then there's a moment, but now they have a means of stopping it because of the collar. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Every dog is different. So I can't guarantee, yeah, for sure, we'll get rid of the reactivity. I'm pretty positive that we will with what I'm hearing here. But I have to leave some margin for, you know, you, I got to think about you guys. You know, if you're not following through with the training 100%, you're not going to get the full effectiveness of the training, you know. So, like, you know, the collar goes to 127. And let's say we work with Remington and he's doing great and you're struggling with one particular type of reactivity, like when a dog barks at him or something. And I tell you, you have to go to 100 when that happens to stop Remington, right? Then I see you again. I go, how'd it go? And then you're like, Jesse, it was great. But again, Remington started barking and we couldn't stop him. And I'll say, did you go to 100? And you'll say, no, we only went to 50. I'll go, 50 is not 100. So you're not going to stop that behavior. That makes sense. Yeah. So, yeah. and it, I don't suspect this with Remington, but... I tell all my clients, if you're struggling with this kind of behavior, you have to be prepared to do so in order to get the results, you know? So if you're willing to go to that extent to stop the behavior, then I'm not worried about whether or not if we're going to get it because you're willing to do the work. Okay. So do you think this will change his personality at all? No. I mean, is this, no. It just means when you have him under control, he's going to be focused right? He's going to be under control. He's not going to be happy jumping all over the place when he's in heel because that's counter, that's counter active to what you want. Cause, cause, cause this energy here very easily becomes bark, bark, bark. Oh yeah. You need a passive focused dog that's walking with you. And then when you come across open area and it's free and no dogs are there and you go, okay, Remington break. And then Remington comes out and he's hopping around. He's running all over the place because now he's, he's free. He's released from command. But then when I see a dog coming, Remington, get over here. He comes to you, sit. He sits down. Now he's calm again because mm -hmm. he's under control. Mm -hmm. okay. When he's in the home, he's still going to be Remington because he's not okay. under control. Yeah. Okay. So, Is age a factor at all um, with training dogs or no? What was that? Is age a no. factor? No. no. I've trained all ages. Yeah, doesn't matter because it's about discipline. So Jesse, what, what would it be? Would he come and stay with you? Would we, how, how, just give us an ideal setup of how to, how would we start this? How many people would be involved with Remington? <laughs> Francisco, yeah. So one, two, three, four, five, six. <laughs> okay. So, uh, I would suggest a board and train. Okay? A what? A board and train where we take Remington and we train them here at my space. Okay. Um, because I know pr prior with the other trainer, uh, scheduling was an issue, right? So trying to get six people to coordinate plus coordinating with me is going to be problematic. So I typically don't recommend board and trains for behavior cases because it's really educating um, the owner. But your case is, is simple. And we have videos of dogs that we've trained that are completely uncut that I would forward to you so you can watch it and understand the process, okay? Because that's super important is that you understand the process so that should you find yourself in that situation, you have a baseline, found, baseline foundation of how to approach it. Okay, of course we would teach you, but let's say we return Remington to you and he's great. 
and you don't see reactivity for six months. And then one day, a dog lunges at him. And Remington goes, what? And he lunges back. It's understandable, right? You would then need the tools to stop that moment. But if you've not seen it, how would you know? Right? right. So what we've begun doing with our board and trains because of COVID is uh, recording training sessions. We, re we, re we record the first session of everything that we teach. Okay. And we make a video and we send it to you. So you can see it and you can understand it. And then each week we make, after the first week, each week after we make a kind of comprehensive, this is where Remington is at now. Okay. So again, you're seeing it and you can keep re-seeing it if you need to. So you have a resource and then it comes with follow-up lessons. Um, so this way, all your staff can watch the videos on their own time. Right. Okay. So it educates them. So then this way, when we do the follow-up stuff, if only four out of six staff show up, not a big deal. I'll work with the four, but then the other two, um, excuse me, my computer. There we go. Um, the other two can get filled in. Okay. And we've also become, uh, we've also started recording training sessions. So then the two that couldn't make it can simply watch the video that they missed and it'll update them on, on what everybody's learned. Okay. okay? Um, in terms of length of time, it really depends on how much control you want over Remington. Okay. If you want a fully off leash trained dog, which is walking off leash, come and call it off leash, you tell him to lay down, he doesn't move for two to three hours. You know, we're, we're talking like, like high level control. That takes longer. If your concern is, I want to address the reactivity. I want to be able to walk my dog without pulling. I want him to come to me when I call him off leash. Then that's much simpler, shorter time frame. Okay. Remington is, if you're doing a board and train, is in the two to four week window. Okay. Okay. The two week board and train is like 50 to 70% uh, uh, obedience wise, that would be like 50 to 70% done. Okay. And then, of course, we would teach you, but then it's your job to finish everything off to get them to 100% or to get them where you need them to. Okay. Three weeks would be like, uh, like kind of 70 to 80%, maybe 90%. And then four weeks is 90 to hundred percent. Okay. But we still have to transfer everything to you. He's not going to just learn how to sit down, come stay heel. And then when you say it, he's not just going to immediately do it for you because a con to the board and train is that we're the ones that train them. Okay. Right. So everything is related to us, which is why we provide so much follow-up because we want the dog to transfer everything then to you. So if you did the board and train, you, we would not interact until the end of that time, or would we also come to you once a week or something to, how, how, how does that work? Correct. So uh, if the dog is here for two weeks, ideally the uh, family would come once at the end of each week, Mm -hmm. to to learn where what he's learning and kind of go along with Remington okay uh in other cases the per, the family will complete the entire board and train and then they'll they'll schedule the pickup and the pickup is typically around two hours for the lesson because we go over everything okay mm -hmm. and then you would schedule follow-up lessons that come with the board and train package when you need them okay so mm -hmm. let's say your staff goes and they do the two hour lesson, right? And everything's great with Remington for months. And then six months later, it's like, we're having an issue. You still have, you'll still have a number of classes that came in the package of the board and train. You just call us up. Hey, we need to use that class. You schedule it. We show up and then we fix what we help you fix whatever's going on. And then, you know, we part ways. Or some people will just consecutively keep using their lessons until they feel they're good and they might use all their lessons or they just might use a few of them. How many okay. lessons are included in the whatever? Uh, for the two week, uh, you get, I think it's a total of six hours of follow-up. Let me pull up my website here real quick. 
Oh, maybe we have that. You don't have to. Yeah. We have that information. It's on my website. Okay. Um, but I look at it as hours of work. So let's say I, the two week is six hours because it's one hour the first week, two hours for the pickup, and then it's three follow up sessions, which is a total okay. of six hours. Okay. So let's say you use two hours and you're perfectly fine and you're good, and, but you still have four hours left over. Okay. And then when you need them, you schedule them. You can schedule them right away, you schedule them down the line. They don't expire. You let us know. Okay. okay. Um, I will say, uh, I, I, I hate sounding like a salesperson, but this is very important, mm -hmm. is that a lot of places that do boarding trains do not provide adequate follow-up. Okay. I've had people that I've trained their dogs after a boarding train, their dog's been gone for four weeks. They spend half an hour with the trainer and that's it. Yeah. Okay. If someone, if we have a four week boarding train, that is going to be 10 hours of follow up that the owner's going to get with that four week boarding train, if I'm remembering it correctly. Right. So okay. we provide a lot because we do this every day. You know, we're professionals and we're having to change the thought process. You know, like we're talking about e-collar and correcting and having maybe to go to hundred and all these things, right. Is you're, there's going to be a pretty big gap when you get Remington back from where he was before, you know, right. and it's not because we're miracle workers and you know, all that stuff is because we know what we're doing. We're professionals and we've put in a lot of work, um, right. which is why we started filming things as well, because I'm all about educating the owners, because the more you know, the less you'll need us in the long run. So where is your boarding facility? And, you know, do you have photos of that on the, I mean, it's a caged boarding facility, probably, We're right? Square. It's a 13,000 square foot space. Mm -hmm. uh, we use standard dog kennels, you know, the, the wire, wire type kennels. Our boarding trains do get a very large kennel. They get a 52 inch one, because since they're with us for a longer time, we give them uh, a bigger space. Um, they're not kenneled all day. So we train the moment we open to the moment we close. Okay. So uh, we wake up, Remington goes, does his potty, he eats his breakfast, and then his day starts. Okay. Uh, we do give him rest breaks so that obviously they're not working uh, around the clock. He gets his rest breaks. And if we see we're making progress with him with socialization, then he'll also get to partake in the daycare activities. Um, my facility is very simple, very plain. It's a big open space. It's not fancy, um, but the quality of work is, is very good. And how many dogs do you have there at the same time? Because um, we just opened uh, September of last year. Um, the most we built up to was about 16 to 20 in terms of like daycare dogs and boarding dogs. When it comes to boarding trains, we only take four at a time because we want to make sure that we have enough time to, to, to work with all the dogs uh, uh, evenly. Um, we also take them outside the train. They go to, my employees take them to Horner Park, they go to Oz Park, they go to Home Depot, they go to PetSmart. They expose the dog outside and use the obedience outside once they start learning the skills to prep them for going back home. How many hours a day do you actually train versus having them in their kennel? At least 12. Oh, wow. So he's yeah. out of the kennel 12 hours. Yeah. yeah. The, the only time we, and even after hours, because we close at seven Monday through Friday, after hours, he's still out, but he may not be act like he might have a rest break in our pen area where he's able to just walk around and stretch his legs and, you know, maybe play ball and stuff like that if he has ball drive. Um, but then at 10 o'clock, it's lights out. And then the next day starts at seven. And is there anybody there overnight? Yeah. Um, Me. You are. Oh, okay. Yeah, I live here. Ah. Yep. Because we don't, so a facility is required, uh, if they don't have staff 24 7, they have to have a sprinkler system and a fire alarm system that is connected to the fire department so that if anything happens, fire department is immediately alerted and they come here. Uh, since we don't have that set up and I'm only here for three years because uh, we're going to tear this down, uh, I'm here 24 7. Me and my brother. So there's two people on premises all the time. And, and how big is your staff that trains? Like how many people would Remington be working with? 
Uh, one, two, three, four, about approximately five. That's me and then Enrique, Brianna, Corey, and Natty. So he's being handled by a number of different personalities, different size people. And Maddie's super tiny. She's like five foot something, 90 pounds. Uh, mm -hmm. Brianna's like five, three, and she's walked a schnauzer, not a schnauzer, a uh, black Russian terrier that was 140 pounds, you know? Wow. But of course, they were very well trained. Um, and then if, if uh, how would you say, if it's a slow day and I have a lot of clients, sometimes we take the boarding trains out with me to work with clients. So they're outside of Oz Park all day. So they're not always at the facility. Like we give them breaks and stuff like that. Um, Cause we've done that with a few boarding trains where we were out filming and we needed dogs for distraction so that we use the dogs that were here with us training for that distraction. And then they get to reinforce their training as well. So, mm -hmm. How'd you get into this? What's your background? Uh, 10 years ago, I adopted a, a chow mix in Texas. And she was very scared of people, very nervous. And, you know, I didn't like seeing her being shy and nervous and stuff. And it, uh, I started looking for answers. I didn't find anything that made sense to me. And then I came across Cesar Milan. I'm not sure if you're familiar with Cesar Milan, the dog whisperer. Uh, yeah. He, had, he had the TV show. He, uh, he was known as the dog whisperer. And then I came across his DVD. I watched his DVD, uh, it resonated really well with me. And then I studied his methodology. And then I, um, on YouTube, I would watch videos. And then I came across Richard Hines, who's my mentor. He's known as the Miami Dog Whisperer. And uh, I worked for a year or so, saved up a lot of money, and then flew down to Miami to do the three month internship with him. And then back in 2012, I moved back to Chicago and then started my business here in 2012. So you worked with him for a while, Richard Hines? Correct, three months. Richard Hines, can you write that down? I just wanna, and who, who was the first person that you mentioned? Cesar oh, Cesar Milan. Oh, yeah. yeah. I didn't meet him, but uh, I met him once at a, at a he did a, like a, a visit to a shelter. So I met him there, uh -huh. but he had a number of DVDs and TV shows. So I, I studied all his material. But Richard okay. Hines, I studied with in person in Miami for three months. Okay, great. And um, you're more than welcome to go to our YouTube channel okay. and you'll see all the dogs that we've been training in person. And in some of those videos we would actually use for you as reference, you know, like with the reactivity stuff. Right. So like you get a visual of like, this is what it looks like when things are going bad and this is what you do to handle it. And this is what it should look like once you've addressed the issue. Yeah, I'd like to do that. Mm -hmm. So. Yeah, for sure. That's why they're there. You know, okay. uh, a really good one. I'm sorry. A really good one to watch would be Finn. Uh, F I N N lesson one. There's two fins. You want to look at the one that's the German shepherd looking dog. Okay. That's he was, he came to us really bad and I'm just uploading a second bit because we saw him yesterday for the second time, night and day, night and day with that. Huh. With his, uh, How long did that take to correct? that how long how long was uh, it well t it technically we, we corrected it in one class but it took we didn't see her for two weeks because of fourth of july um and the lady she's a medical doctor so her, her schedule changes um so we didn't see her in two weeks but we only went over we only did one class wow yeah so and you'll see so if you see lesson one and then when lesson two goes up i, I recommend you watch that as well because you'll see the a world of a difference it was, it was crazy. So I'm really proud of that. Really proud of the work she did because she was very nervous about, oh my God, like, you know, he's so bad and this and that. And it, it was like, he was very reactive. But right. then he came back so much more confident, so much more relaxed. The dog was so calm. Uh, he didn't react once the entire second lesson. So, wow. Yep. We know what Great. we're doing. <laughs> Good. And then, um, you know, should we decide to move forward? Are you, do you have four dogs in training now or do you have space available or how? We have space available. We just wrapped up two. We had one that was with us for a week, but then he had to get neutered. Um, and then he's gonna come back and we'll have him for another three weeks, but he won't start till beginning of next week to finish off his four week program. Um, and then we have one coming actually, I think later this week, it's a puppy. We have two puppies coming in, so we still have a, a fourth spot. 
um, and it's first come, first serve. But then Maria will just tell you, if we get booked up, she'll tell you when our, our next opening would be. Next availability. Okay. Correct. Well, let us look at some of your videos and uh, check it out. But this sounds really good. And uh, we just don't want Remington's personality to change. He's oh, like a bizarre weirdo. But, um, <laughs> you know, I there is a... a training place I visited. I can't even remember. I think it's called ABC or something. Um, scared me to death. I mean, they had dogs that had to sit on cubes with electric shock collars on. And when I visited, there were caged areas. They had broomsticks on sure. the top of the cage. And I was like, uh, and I had people that have sent their dogs there. It's a boot camp. Sure. Uh, but they are totally like just um, all personality gone at the end. It's sort of broken dogs and sure. you know, we don't want that. We don't want that. Um, yeah. The way we approach it is, um, in every case is that like, if, I, if you had a very severe case, I tell you we might end up with something like that in the beginning, but then once the dog relaxes, you'd see them kind of come back uh -huh. because it's so severe. You know, your case is, is standard stuff. You know, uh, the leash reactivity and the fact that he was social at one place, you know, like, like I, I see a lot of things where I'm like, I don't, I don't perceive that from this dog. Um, in the beginning, it's not uncommon to see what looks like mopiness or what people call depression, but it's not. It's, they're, they're so used to seeing their dog being excited, but it's their dog being calm. You know, but they're, mis, they're misinterpreting it. But your dog being excited all the time isn't healthy, you know. But it's yeah. when appropriate when you go to play ball with them, if you're letting them off leash at like, you know, the hiking trail and stuff like that, you're going to see them open up and be Remington. And he will be Remington in the house. But when you have control and need control, it's going to be, okay, I'm an obedient citizen and I have to, you know, behave myself uh, and not be happy-go-lucky at, at this particular moment. So. Okay. So do you okay. recommend the two-week program then based on what you know or – Longer. A minute, yeah. So the a minimum of two week, two weeks. Um, but that's all I'm saying. If, if it depends on how much control you're wanting, if okay. if you go hiking with them and you and you're wanting the off leash reliability of, you know, he's walk. If you need that tight close heel while you walk through the the hike trail, you have it. And then when you want him to be free, you have that as well. But you can always call him back. Um, if you're camping and you need him to lay down and stay put for a while while you're setting up a campfire or something, you can also have that. Um, it really comes down to how much control you're wanting. Um, think of the four-week program as the total package. Right. Okay? He's, he's completely off leash trained, everything. And then the two-week program is we would focus on the essentials, which would be recall or come when called, the leash walking, and the reactivity. We teach more things, but we would really focus on those things knowing that we only have them for two weeks. If we have them for four weeks, then we can work on everything to a much higher degree because we have a longer time. So we prioritize things according to what's, what we think is important. So, Is it possible uh, if we did a two week and decide we want more training to do an additional two weeks? Is Absolutely. That... Okay. Yeah, no problem. You have a question? Yes, uh, Remington is groomed every week. I don't think he can hear you oh. that far. Uh, Remington is groomed every week. Should we postpone uh, grooming once uh, Mrs. Craver decides to send the... Where do you take them grooming? Uh, basically, the, the, place, the name of the place is uh, uh, Pet Friendly. Uh, uh, where are they? Like, what neighborhood? On the Clyburn. On the yeah. Clyburn. It's just a uh, half an hour drive. Okay, I mean, because we could, if you want him to keep up his grooming, we could either one, you could postpone it, and then towards the end, we'll take him for you to get groomed, so that when you pick him up, he's ready to go. Or if you want to keep up the weekly groom, uh, we could take him once a week, as long as it's close by, there's just a transportation fee. Okay, thank so. you. Mm -hmm. okay. All right. Okay, well, terrific. Um, you sound very knowledgeable. Thank you. Thank you. I've been doing this for 10 years, so huh. yeah. <laughs> I would hope I sound knowledgeable. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, if you have, it's, 
it's getting to where you know we don't want even to hurt anyone uh other other dogs uh and or us when he jerks um sure. you know um yeah so. no i had i had a dog who was very friendly dogs and people loved everybody everything but broke his owner's shoulder twice and sent them to the er three times in two years Whoa. <laughs> so, so yeah, uh, you know, uh, uh, and he's about 60 to 70 pounds. He's, he's a, he's a sizable dog and all he did was pull his owner down, you know? So it, it, even if it is a friendly dog in my book, they need good training because things like that happen. And that's not the first client that I've had. Uh, I've had people break wrists, fingers, dislocate elbows, dislocate shoulders, break hips, you know, break an ankle. It's, it, Training is, is a necessity when you have a large dog, so. Yeah, yeah, Anya was walking Remington a, a while ago and he pulled and she was on ice and she broke her wrist, so. Yeah. It's a, Ooh, yeah. Sorry to hear that. Yeah. Um, if you have any questions or concerns, feel free to reach out, you know, Maria will be in contact with you. Okay. Um, and then I'll have her follow up with you just so that she gets that communication going. Take your time, watch the videos, uh, educate yourself. That's why all that stuff is there. And then when you're ready, you just let us know. Okay, great. Thank you, Justin. Thank, Thank you. you. Take care. Thank you. Pleasure. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.